One of Britain's most iconic sniper rifles in history was recently fielded in only 2008 in Helmand province, Afghanistan. The AX338 variant recently showed up in the hands of Russian Spetsnaz snipers in Ukraine, raising questions about who exactly is selling them and how can they be stopped. You're probably already familiar with the famous weapon from its appearance in popular video games and as the one-time world record holder for longest confirmed sniper shot in military history. But would you believe this fancy professional sniper rifle actually has very humble origins starting off in someone's garage? But before we get into that, there's something I can no longer avoid. My arms and just about everything about me is ultra hairy. That's why this fall I'm joining the 6 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped to take care of my hairiness problem by going to manscaped.com and using code TAS to get 20% off. The Platinum Package 4.0 can align your entire hygiene routine all in one swoop. This force multiplier includes the Lawnmower 4.0, Weed Whacker nose and hair trimmer. It's got the ultra premium body wash and ultra premium two in one shampoo and conditioner. This package comes with a crop preserver ball deodorant and crop reviver ball toner. No more complaints about my downstairs business. Both the Lawn Mower 4.0 and Weed Whacker offer proprietary advanced skin safe technology to protect your delicate bits. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts, Manscaped boxers and shed travel bag. These boxers are so smooth they make me want to say hua unironically. So get the platinum package this fall by going to this episode's partner manscaped.com and get 20% off and free shipping with code TAS. Manscaped Clear out the leaves, it's your tree trunk's time to shine. The rifle was created by a company called Accuracy International, but don't be fooled by the glamorous name. Accuracy International in the mid-1970s was simply two chaps called David Walls and David Cake. In the British gun world, these two were sometimes referred to as the Daves. They originally gained some attention when they were producing a couple of high-quality 1900s era Colt pistol replicas purely by using images referenced out of books. They did such an outstanding job that Colt recommended they go into the firearms business, especially considering they were going off simply pictures. Fast forward by a few years and here we have to introduce Olympic shooter Malcolm Cooper. Malcolm had also seen the Colt replicas, which left an impression on him. He encouraged the two Daves to create highly accurate target rifles. This led to the creation of their firearms company called Accuracy International, or AI, in 1978. Malcolm Cooper is an important figure in this story because not only was he a gold medal winner in the 1984 and 1988 Olympics, but he managed to get a couple of their rifles into the hands of British Special Forces. The British Special Forces soldiers gave the Daves some feedback on how to improve their rifle. You see, the British military was starting to look for a replacement for their L42A1 at the time. The two Daves were good craftsmen they knew how to manufacture firearms. But they were very new to the scene and they hadn't really built up much of a reputation. They were quite literally just two guys in a garage building rifles. So when they submitted their rifle to the actual professional British military for feedback, they thought the best case scenario that they would get was some constructive criticism and feedback. They never thought that they would win the competition to replace the British rifle. They were shocked when their rifle won the trials against opponents like SIG and HK, institutional names. At this point, the Daves found themselves in a bit of a firearms pickle because the UK military immediately requested a visit to Accuracy International's manufacturing location. This was part of a routine, formal process to ensure that these Daves weren't just a couple of blokes working out of a garage, which is exactly what they were. This called for a bit of classic British winging it. They rented an industrial warehouse and placed weapons parts in different stages of completion and laid out tools and benches in order for it to look like they were a much bigger company than they really were. When the inspectors go there, the two Daves kind of rush them through the process really quickly. A whole fake it till you make it sort of deal. And they were like, hey, let's just grab lunch as fast as humanly possible all the while hoping that the British government didn't order too many sniper rifles because frankly they couldn't scale the production line that fast. They would have to hire hundreds of skilled weapons craftsmen and install all kinds of machining tools in order to fill a large order. On the way out the door, at the end of the day, one of the inspectors made a comment along the lines of, yeah, we weren't worried, we just wanted to make sure you weren't two guys working out of a shed. Their sleight of hand magic trick illusion had work. 
the military representative was satisfied with their visit. But this was just the start of their problems that they were gonna have to solve if this rifle was ever gonna become a legend. Their first contract was to build a number of rifles for the SAS and the SBS British Special Forces. The rifle they would develop was called the L96A1, nicknamed Green Meanie. This was the rifle that made Accuracy International what it is today. The L96A1 would face a lot of manufacturing drama, mainly because the truth came out and the rifle had to be subcontracted to an external company for manufacturing. The trouble was this external company made high-tech missiles, not rifles. They weren't gun guys, and they cut corners and adjusted components to make the rifles cheaper to produce. This is typical for early rifles, but it meant that the first batch of rifles sent to soldiers for for testing ended up having multiple problems and even a number of explosions that injured some British troops, basically triggering a cease and desist alert throughout the British military of, if you have them, stop firing them to prevent any more casualties. After this, the manufacturing was given solely back to AI, who figured out the problems and returned the rifles to soldiers in a matter of weeks. Extremely quick for something like this. When Accuracy International went through the rifle and investigated problems, they found that the external company used a different alloy on the firing pin. Because the contractor took some liberties with the technical specifications, the firing pin started breaking just right by the cocking piece, basically the rear of the firing pin. This is particularly bad because the spring would push the firing pin way too far forward and detonate a cartridge while chambering around. And the controversy isn't over yet. A 2018 Sky News report showed proof of variants of this sniper rifle ending up in the hands of Russian Special Forces snipers in Ukraine. The revelation came from experts spotting the rifles in helmet cam footage filmed by the Russian troops themselves. A geolocating expert was actually able to use images of a nearby house in the video and then cross-reference it with satellite images in Ukraine to confirm that the footage was actually shot in Ukraine. A further investigation by Sky News showed the Russians had been using the weapons for the past two years, so even as far back as 2016, even though the British government never approved the weapons for export to Russia. We have one of the strictest arms licensing regimes in the world. None of this points to any wrongdoing by Accuracy International. What likely happened is the sales were approved to individuals in Russia who then sold it to the Russian military units. The problem lies in the UK government's open individual export license, which is quote unquote more flexible and avoids the need to apply for a new license for every export. The open export license doesn't limit the number of weapons that can be sold, and according to Sky News, the government rarely knows where those arms end up. The UK government said it was concerning the sniper rifles ended up in the Russians' hands, although it's not unprecedented to see American weapons suspiciously ending up in the enemy's hands as well. So why do modern day sniper rifles use the bolt action if it's outdated and obsolete? It has an old school ancient method of chambering each round with a bolt action. The full powered 762 by 51 mm NATO cartridge gives it accuracy past 1000 meters. The L96A1 only has a rate of fire about 20 rounds per minute and an M14 sniper rifle can fire 700 rounds per minute. There are a few interesting reasons why to use a bolt action. Bolt actions are fancy, eclectic, acquired taste. It's a special tool for a special job. It's the fedora wearing, culturally educated sniper who uses the precision bolt action rifle. The weapon is a trade off because it takes far longer to chamber the next round, but this cycling system gives the shooter superior accuracy, better reliability, and lighter overall weight. These are considerations that are only going to matter for the highest skilled shooters who are engaging at the longest possible distances around 1,000 meters or above. The bolt action trigger also reportedly requires less pounds of pressure needed to engage the shot. This can mean slightly smoother trigger pulls, which translate to greater accuracy. If you look through firearms blogs and forums, you'll see all kinds of different competing theories as to why modern day snipers still often use bolt action sniper rifles. It's something of a lively debate, with some people insisting it's only because snipers want to hide their ejected shells neatly so that the enemy can't find any evidence of where they were, while other people insist that bolt actions really aren't that much more accurate. The L96A1 was a level above the rest, as it was the first purpose-built sniper rifle for the British military. It was built on a chassis system, meaning nothing was permanently glued together like traditional bolt-action rifles, which was great from a military point of view because it meant that the weapon was more modular, allowing for different configurations. If any part was damaged, you could remove just that one part and replace it, making the turnaround time on repairs much faster. This was actually one of the big deciding factors as to why the UK Ministry of Defense chose this sniper rifle, because armorers would be much easier to train up and require less specialty equipment. 
What this chassis system meant for the rifle was that everything was bolted directly to the receiver and independent of each other. Because this was a competition rifle, it incorporated some features that no other military service rifles had used up until that point. And in fact, it was so ahead of its time that it took decades for other militaries to issue rifles with the same features of which are commonplace today in the enthusiast community like hair triggers and precision barrels. The most important of these features for Accuracy International was the barrel to be free floated. Anything that touches the barrel can mess up the harmonics and affect your zero. Previous service rifles had full length wooden stocks which forced you to bed the stock to increase accuracy, but the L96A1 didn't have that problem. The L96A1 had a major impact on the War on Terror. British higher-ups saw how effective their snipers were in the following wars against an insurgency, and British commanders realized that in a conflict where intelligence gathering and minimal collateral damage was essential, you didn't need to make a grid square to explode to be effective. Snipers took a frontline role in operations where there was no front line. To put it this way, instead of using a full platoon and putting their lives at risk to kick in doors, take down an IED team, you could use a two-man sniper team to do the same effect with a reduced risk of them becoming casualties. The main reason being that the enemy wouldn't know where they were being attacked from, and even if they did, the enemy didn't have the range to fight back. The Green Meanie was a massive hit with the British troops. One of the rifle's major claims to fame is a record-breaking shot that was fired by British Army Corporal Craig Harrison, who pushed the boundaries of sniping further than had ever been done before at the time. The year was 2009 in Afghanistan. A combined patrol of British Cavalry and Afghan National Army were moved through the province of Helmand, where they were ambushed by the Taliban. The front of the convoy was being engaged by two insurgent machine gun teams. Harrison began to engage the Taliban. He set his scope to the maximum distance and then fired nine shots to establish where his shots were landing, one of the Taliban soldiers had knocked a head off a water pump to flood the field in front of the British, turning the field into knee-high quicksand. Harrison took him out first before returning to the rest of the insurgents. He then saw two Taliban operating a PKM from the compound wall behind them. He fired his first shot and missed, and then fired a second shot and the insurgent went down. The rounds were moving so slow near the end of their journey that if the insurgents were wearing body armor, it probably would have been stopped. Harrison admitted he didn't intend to hit them, he was just trying to suppress them and get them to run away. He had to aim 6 feet high and 20 inches wide to hit the target. Basically, he turned his sniper rifle into an artillery piece. Taking out those enemy soldiers caused a morale blow to the Taliban. He didn't know it at the time, but he had just broken the world record of the longest shot in military history at 2,475 meters. Bear in mind, the L-115A3 officially has an effective range of 1,500 meters. The Swedish Army asked Accuracy International to build a variant designed specifically for Arctic Warfare. In response, the Arctic Warfare, or the L-118A2, was created as a variation of the L-96A1. Entering service in 1983, the main difference from the L-96A1 was the larger trigger guard allowing winter gloves to be used while firing a milled bolt, which meant there was less surface to freeze the chamber, allowing it to function at lower temperatures. The AWM now chambered in 338 Lupua Magnum, giving it far more range and power. It's basically one step down from a 50 BMG. The AWM weighs 15 pounds, its overall length is 4 feet and 2 inches. The magazine is single stacked and has a capacity of 5 rounds. This is a downgrade from its predecessor as the L96A1, which had 10 rounds but the cartridge was much smaller. When it comes to optics, the sniper rifle comes fitted with a Schmidt and Bender. For all those who don't know, the Schmidt and Bender are the top spec manufacturers of telescopes in the world. Some weapons take a decade to build up a reputation, but not the Arctic warfare. As soon as British snipers were deployed to the Middle East, the AWM was feared by its enemies. From infantry sniper rifle to special forces to police, this sniper rifle has already built a historic reputation. If you found this video valuable in some way, please hit the like and subscribe button. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, and I'll see you again soon.